Coming up, sovereignty, agriculture, and land rights. The U.S. Department of Agriculture recognizes indigenous farmers. Heather Dawn Thompson heads its tribal relations office. Learn how anthropology inspires Diné chef Freddie Bitsui. We talk voting rights and legal battles with Lakota lawyer Nicole Ducheneau. And Tall Paul shares efforts to support youth. I'm Malia Chavez. Join us for those interviews from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Amarao Hopa, thank you for joining us. Heather Dawn Thompson is clear. You can't have tribal sovereignty without food sovereignty. As director of the Office of Tribal Relations at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, she's in a key post to back those words up with action. ICT's Stuart Huntington has this interview from the Reservation Economic Summit. The uh, Secretary of the United States Department of Agriculture announced two years ago USDA's Indigenous Food Sovereignty Initiative. And this is historic. In all of the years of USDA, we have never had a focus on indigenous peoples or indigenous foods. And we are just honored and delighted to be working with tribal nations and our partner organizations to be implementing this initiative on behalf of the secretary. Uh, give me an example when you say indigenous foods. Uh, take us on the ground to a particular corner of the country. Uh, what's happening? There are several components of our initiative one is leading by example, and that has multiple components. For example, seeds, foraging, cooking, all really important parts of our indigenous foods in every region. And for each of those, we've broken it down by different regions per your question. And so we have created seed saving banks in each different region. We have done foraging videos in two or three different regions and we're expanding each year into additional regions. And we're doing indigenous cooking videos in each region. We started with some of the better known chefs in Indian country like Sean Sherman. If you go to our website, you can see him cooking his and some of his indigenous foods and indigenous recipes where he is incorporating commodity foods from our commodity food packages with indigenous foods. Uh, Heather, yesterday we spoke with attorney Nicole Ducheneau and she said that she really was uh, excited about the USDA programs because agriculture is, is such a deeply rooted part of Native American culture. It's so true. You can't be a sovereign nation if you can't feed your own people. Food sovereignty is tribal sovereignty. And unfortunately, the federal government played a strong role in disrupting the food systems in Indian country, sometimes accidentally, but sometimes very purposefully. And so the USDA has a trust and treaty responsibility to try and help restore those food systems. It is a part of our people for time immemorial. For Nikki, she's also a citizen of the Cheyenne River Sioux tribe. And so one really important animal for her nation, and my nation is bison, for example. And the United States government played a very strong role in the destruction of the bison in order to cut off access to independent food sources for the Great Plains tribes. And so the USDA has taken its trust and treaty responsibility very seriously to try and restore those connections to those bison herds. We are including bison in our food packages. We are working on purchasing tribal bison. We just created a manual for cattle ranchers that are interested in transitioning back to bison ranching. And we are working with our partner, the Intertribal Bison Cooperative, on creating another manual on field handling of bison, um, and that should be out later this year. It seems like the revitalization of the bison herds is 
got a lot of momentum right now. It really does, and for the, tr the tribes that have that cultural affiliation with bison, the revitalization of bison is seen as a corollary of the revitalization of the people. Same for people that have that affiliation with salmon or other animals um, that have historically kept those peoples alive and have a symbiotic and cultural relationship with them. And so we are trying to do our part at USDA and being good partners in revitalizing those important indigenous animals. Uh, Heather, along with the revitalization of the bison herds comes meat processing needs. Uh, is there any movement in that realm? Meat processing is a huge concern for a lot of rural America. And we saw during COVID incredible disruption in the supply chain and a backup in local meat processing. And diversifying the availability of meat processing is a huge priority for this administration. What we've heard from tribal communities, however, is really unique and different than other rural communities. What we've heard is we want to make sure that our protein sources are indigenous animals. And that's different than what USDA has focused on in the past. We've really focused on Western animals, cattle, uh, chicken, pork. And what we've heard from tribal communities is we want to focus on seafood. We want to focus on reindeer, moose, bison. We want to do field harvesting, which we think is more culturally appropriate and humane for our animals. And so they've really challenged USDA to think differently about how we fund and finance meat processing. And we're taking that challenge very seriously. Uh, Heather, the other day I got to sit down with Dick Trudell, who had a long career in D.C. focused on Native American issues and progress. And his observation was that the Biden administration has appointed more Native Americans than any previous uh, administration. You're part of that. Uh, is that exciting? It is exciting and it's really an honor. And I have to say, it really matters when you have people that have lived experiences in Indian country and have that expertise in federal Indian law and the trust and treaty responsibility, it completely changes the conversation at the table. And I think you're seeing that in the policy changes in this administration. On a daily basis, you're seeing barriers removed and a complete shift in the way the federal government honors its trust and treaty responsibility in Indian country. Heather, do you think that there's a way that that can last and not come and go with administrations? I hope so. We're really trying to institutionalize the knowledge, and that's the key. When people know better, they do better. And we're starting to see our legal offices, our policy offices, have more and more exposure to Indian country and more and more knowledge about their trust and treaty responsibility, and that lasts. Heather Dawn, thank you so much for visiting with us. We appreciate it. It was my honor. Thank you. Navajo chef and anthropologist Freddie Bitsui was among the attendees at Res 2023. ICT's Shirley Snavy has this interview with him about what classifies as traditional or authentic native foods. So what inspired you to uh, be a chef? Understanding the historical context of how native people ate. I originally had majored in anthropology at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, and I believed that there were people in prehistoric lives who we deem as our ancestors, not just some type of um, story or that people were, I viewed them as human. There was lazy people, there were hungry people, there were gossipers, there, everything that we do today as far as our emotion, it was still pretty much I think was, was intact back then, so there had to be, have been two people who cooked and said, you know, I cook better than you. And that notion, I think, um, has always been a part of human um, societal evolution. And by the time 2009 came around, I started my own consulting company, which I went to rural casinos, and then I would train people how to cut their food costs, um, be better cooks, because unfortunately, in, in the food world, nobody says I want to go to rural Minnesota and be a chef. Everybody wants to go to New York or people want to go to California and be a chef. So I thought that if I could do these consulting um, gigs, it, it, it would empower the, the culinarians in, 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 in their respective commun um, communities and casinos. And it worked. It, it, was a really good, it was a really good gig. And then I started um, getting involved with um, my own casino and I became the executive chef for uh, the casino that's in Gallup. And I, I was only there for a year and that's when Washington called. And apparently I had built my name so big from 2009 to 2015 
that they called me for the job. Like I wasn't even looking for the job. They just said, hey, you want to be the chef here? Which inadvertently was my dream job. So I, I didn't even have to think. And I managed to, uh, it may not be a, be a big move for non-culinarians or non-anthropologists, non but what I did was I managed to get rid of the words traditional and authentic because the museum, when we put something out that was authentic, we, we, I've always got into little scuffles with people and they would say, wait, my grandmother didn't make it like this, so it's not authentic. It opened my eyes to the e enormity of uh, the culinary culture in with different tribes and with different peoples throughout um, North America and Mexico. So that's where all my studies came from. And I, I, you know, I continued to study working there and um, it managed to open my eyes so much broader to the whole Native America food spectrum. And that's what, what inadvertently came out of my book which is called New Native Kitchen, you know, which you can get on Amazon. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's kind of where everything's at now. And um, I'm collaborating with a lot more chefs now. That's why I'm here because Don Sherman has been presenting and I've just been, um, we're, we're planning on things together in the future, hopefully. You've had an opportunity to work with tribes all over the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, wh what would be some of the things that you were surprised to learn about regional cuisine? I think one thing that I was surprised to learn is how much people um, tend to think traditional food is when it's really like uh, post-reservation. And I, uh, uh, like for example, I, I don't, I don't, I believe that there's no point in putting any food down, but like there's a lot of spam involved, and they call it traditional food, which is is fine. Which which it 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 it's fine because it's been part of someone's emotion. It's been part of someone's you know walk in life and their families and everything in, in that capacity. But prior to um, uh, uh, when all the tribes were relocated and how, like for example, I, the example I use is the Delaware tribe was obviously living in the Delaware area because there's no Delaware in Oklahoma, right? So just imagine when you have abundance of food from the, the seas, the water, the bays, um, the woodlands, and then you're transferred to another place where there's absolutely nothing, so you have to adapt. Cooking with oil was, was, was not um, in our culture. And what I mean by that is putting oil in a, on a pan and letting it get hot and then hearing that sizzle. Now we did put fat in food, like um, wild boar uh, lard into cornmeal. That's how we make tamales. So when, when we use those processes, yeah, we're cooking with oil or fat, but it's a different type of technique. So even as minute, small techniques as these cooking processes are, it just changes it completely. And that's exactly what happened. And um, trying to revitalize and talk about the history is one thing, but trying to convince grandma is a whole different task. So that, that's where I think a lot of the Native American and, and, and um, indigenous chefs are right now, just trying to convince um, people who are, have their heels dug in to not change. Is, is, is quite a, a, a task. The younger people are more a, a, a adapting to it. I, I, I'm very surprised about that. Well, Freddie Batsui, it's been just wonderful to meet you. Well, thank so you, thank you very me. much. It's, it's been a pleasure, thank you. That was Chef Freddie Batsui. Attorney Nicole Ducheneau fought the Dakota Access Pipeline in court. Correction, is still fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline in court. She is a veteran on the legal front lines fighting for Native rights. ICT's Shirley Snavy caught up with her at the Res Conference in Las Vegas, where she led a panel on Native voting rights. So voting rights is a really hot and important issue in Indian country right now, um, simply because there are deliberate attacks on the right of Native people to participate in state um, municipal and national elections. Um, and, you know, we do have some reluctance in Indian country to get involved in politics, but it is so, so critically important uh, to our own sovereignty um, who we elect in a state and national and even a local election um, has a huge impact on tribes. And, you know, we see it on a broad level. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we elected Donald Trump. 
uh, and the composition of the U.S. Supreme Court changed and an already anti-Indian court has become incredibly hostile to Indians. And that is a direct result of that national vote. Um, and, and so what we see out in the localities is that these, you know, local voting officials and local governments are using insidious tactics to make it harder for Native people to vote. And that's a signal that they're scared of our power. I'm often surprised to hear how many Natives don't vote. And they don't vote because they don't think it has anything to do with them. Um, that their vote isn't going to make a difference. And I think even in Nebraska, um, with the four tribes there. Yeah, it, it is disappointing to see that. And, and we really need a grassroots effort on the ground. Um, I, I am really lucky to have a, a relative in my life, my um, now deceased uh, great aunt Lucille Otter, who was a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. Um, and she was famous for getting out the vote on the Flathead Reservation. Um, and still to this day, people will remember her. Oh, Lucille was your aunt. Oh God, she used to come to my house and just back me about voting and I used to hate it but you know now when I go to vote I always think of her um, and we so we need Aunt Lucille's out there in Indian country um, you know because you know people of that generation understood what it was like to not have any power um, and how lucky we are today uh, to have the right to vote and to have um, you know power in our tribal governments um, so I you know I, I really um, happy when I see our grassroots efforts getting out the native vote because it is so incredibly important. This conference is bringing together a wide variety of people, um, mostly that are interested in economic development from a tribal or an independent point of view, and this is a year that we're taking a look at the Farm Bill. Should natives care about the Farm Bill? Absolutely. The Farm Bill is so critically important. Agriculture is absolutely the most natural uh, industry for tribes. Um, although many of us are poor, a lot of our tribes are rich in land. Um, and uh, agricultural industry is part of our cultural history as well. Um, animal husbandry and cultivating the land and the opportunities that the U.S. Department of Agriculture offers for funding and grants um, and, and programs are so critical to Indian Country and there's a lot of untapped resources um, and that my firm Big Fire has uh, started an agriculture practice group uh, that I think is a unique in Indian Country um, where we are working to help tribes um, you know like update their tribal codes for grazing and for um, various things that help make agriculture work uh, in a tribal community um, and then also to advocate for tribes to take advantage of grant funding coming out of the Keep Eagle settlement and programs in the in the Farm Bill um, programs in the USDA and now is absolutely the time because the US Department of Agriculture um, has more advocates for Indian country than we've ever had before um, the general counsel is Janie hip uh, an Indian from Oklahoma the administrator of the Farm Service Administration is my cousin Zach Ducheneau we've got Heather Don Thompson running the tribal program in there and they've all put together excellent teams Teams, and they understand our needs. And the Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, your firm has been involved in that in the past. and Yes, that's right. So I was just absolutely honored to represent my own tribe, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, in the Dakota Access Pipeline litigation, which unbelievably started seven years ago in 2016. Um, and although we do have a, a pipeline under our you know, sacred uh, Minnesota Missouri River, the tribal plaintiffs in that case won uh, almost every step of the way on the law. And what we were always seeking was a full environmental impact statement. And uh, in 2019 and 2020, that's exactly what the district court ruled. And so we've been in that environmental impact statement process ever since. And tribes have been participating and challenging the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on their cozy relationship with the oil company. And so what tribes are doing now is making the record because we will sue again. Um, we're Sioux Indians, that's what we do. <laughs>
<laughs> but you know that was such a highly visible case in Indian country because we had such an amazing turnout from the world and from um, Indian activists and and it's been off the radar but it you know we're still fighting for our sacred river and our sacred mini our sacred water um, and you know we're still getting pushback from the federal government so they better watch out because uh, we'll come for them again. Nikki Duchanel from Big Fire Law Firm, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Shirley. Tall Paul wears many hats in Native communities, including being a hip-hop artist and inspirational speaker. I sat down with him in Phoenix last month. He shared some of his latest projects and about his most important role, which is being a dad. Take a look. The last time we touched base with you, you had just released your album on uh, Jim Thorpe. What updates do you have on that? Yeah, so the album's been out since November, I believe I released it, and it's got a lot of good reception. I've been in contact a little bit with some of the Bright Path Strong team who are behind the production of the movie, you know, who knows where that could go. And, but I've got their support. It's been an amazing reception that I've got for that album, though, and now I'm working on a new EP with my group mate, Twin City Tone. We go by Red Poet Society as a native hip-hop duo, and I'm also working on a new solo project. I don't have a name for it yet, but yeah, that's kind of what I'm up to. Other than that, you know, kind of going on tour right now, just doing a lot of different shows around the country. For your new EP, what kinds of topics or um, conversations will you have? Yeah, so my, my new solo EP, I'm going to be talking about, I actually wanted to conceptualize musically some of my uh, sayings or hashtags that I use on social media, which are like smudge life, you know, just being about spiritually um, connecting in my life, you know, uh, giving thanks in the morning and laying on my tobacco, being connected with my gratitude because a lot of positive things result from that when I do that and I get in that mindset. Another one is... Uh, fumbled the baggage, which is kind of interesting story behind that. You know, there was a show opportunity that kind of fell through because there was some mix up and miscommunication between myself and the organizers and some of the other artists. And somebody, uh, you know, kind of was coming at me like, oh man, you fumbled the bag. I was like, no, no, I just fumbled the baggage. You know, like all money ain't good money. You know, if something doesn't align with my morals or something like that. I'm cool with missing that opportunity or whatever, you know, um, and just taking the opportunities that are meant for me. So that's the concept behind that one. Another one is uh, Rap Game Jim Thorpe. Uh, Jim Thorpe was a big inspiration of mine, as we discussed in our previous conversation. And, uh, you know, Rap Game Jim Thorpe is just, I think the concept for that song is I'm just going to rap hard, you know, just like represent the spirit of Jim Thorpe. You know, he was known for being a very good talented athlete but also an activist for native actors and just good positive representation of natives in film and he stood up for natives so i'm gonna try to represent his spirit on that track and just have a you know aggressive tone and delivery on that song and there's some more to it than that there's a few other songs but yeah yeah that's kind of the spirit of that project that i'm working on I saw you recently hosted a podcast. Tell us about the topic and why it was important to you to talk about that. Oh yeah, so I actually did that interview with uh, my, my friend Lila here. And uh, we talked, we just, it was kind of like this, you know, just a natural conversation. We talked a lot about indigenous masculinity and what that means. We talked about, you know, my, my uh, artistry, my recent album, the story of Jim Thorpe. It just kind of went wherever we took it, you know, as a real organic conversation. Probably one of my favorite podcast interviews I've done. You know, I just love it when I can connect with, you know, a host of a podcast and we just conversate and it's not so strict around these rigid questions and things like that. So, yeah, but that was about my artistry, just kind of about my fatherhood, you know, growing up, just my life story and so on. I think indigenous masculinity is something that we don't talk about enough. Um, if there was, you know, one point on that topic that you wanted Native communities to really know, what would that be? Yeah, I mean, the first one that comes to mind, and I don't know that it's necessarily restricted to indigenous masculinity, but ma masculinity in general is um, opening up to the idea that, you know, this concept where, you know, men ain't supposed to cry or men ain't supposed to show emotions, like that's real restrictive 
of our emotional maturity, you know, and, and I kind of grew up influenced by that to the point where it's tough for me to even like shed a tear if I if I'm feeling that, you know, it just like won't come sometimes, you know what I mean? Or oftentimes. And that's kind of uh, crazy, you know, to think about like it's almost an inability. It's not that I'm incapable. It just takes a lot for something like that to happen. And and I, I, I want to see more openness to that in our community. You know, I tell my son, you know, and he, he takes after me a lot. And I tell him, like, man, it's, it's okay for boys to be invulnerable. You know, it's okay for men to be vulnerable. I was taught wrong, and, and I want to make sure I teach you right so that you're more comfortable with that because a more complete man who's uh, in, in touch with both their feminine and their masculine and, you know, all of these different energies that make us human is going to be a stronger man always, you know, kind of like a warrior in a garden, so to speak. So, yeah, yeah, that, that's what I would speak on, you know, just evolving as human beings and spiritual beings and allowing ourselves to be our full selves. How do you think um, for kids who are growing up now, like that that's something 10 years from now or 20 years from now, that that's something that they could really integrate into their life? I think that is definitely on a positive trajectory. I feel like nowadays in general, we are becoming more open to these ideas that have been restricted by colonial, colonial mindsets and, you know, teachings. So I think we're on the right track. You know, I feel like there are a lot more open-minded parents like myself trying to set things on the right track. So I, I think it's getting there. You know, I think we're making good progress. That was rap artist Tall Paul. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.